Good morning, everyone. This is Kimberly Qualls. I'm the Communication and Educations Director for the Kansas Association of County, and we welcome you to today's KAC featured webinar, The County Government's Guide to Understanding the Kansas Open Meetings Act, or fondly known as COMA. We do still have some people joining, so I'm going to go ahead and provide some housekeeping notes for you. Today's Web webinar on the coma is being recorded and we will share the recording link and presentation slides with all registered webinar attendees as well it will be posted on KAC's website and finally it will be included the information will be included in tomorrow's um, Kansas County Happenings e-newsletter which goes out every Friday um, for questions for today's webinar we ask that you please type those into the Q&A. We will be monitoring those questions and um, Jay will be answering those as, as we go through the webinar or potentially at the end. We do have approximately 100 people registered for today's webinar. So we do have a good audience that's going to be out there. So that's why we would really appreciate those questions to go in the Q&A because generally once you have a question, somebody will have that same question and that way everyone will be able to um, watch the discussion there. Um, and I think with that, it looks like the participants have slowed down. So let's go ahead and I'm going to introduce Jay Hall who is KAC's Deputy Director and General Counsel. And he is going to tell you everything you could ever want to know about the Kansas Open Meetings Act. So, Jay, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you to everyone that has joined here this morning for uh, the presentation on the Kansas Open Meetings Act. I am happy to be with you this morning. Um, I don't know that I will tell you necessarily everything you could ever want to know, but I am going to try to cover a good bit of the information um, on the Kansas Open Meetings Act. So I look forward to, to spending the next uh, the next hour or so with you on this on this topic. All right, so the Kansas Open Meetings Act, or COMA as it is often known in shorthand, is about transparency. Um, by statute, it says that meetings shall be open to the public because a representative government is dependent upon an informed electorate. To make that a little bit simpler, basically it is saying that in order for people to know what is going on, they have to be able to see what their government is doing so that they can understand the issues and more, more usefully participate in government and government activities. And that's why we have the Open Meetings Act, is so that we can be transparent, so that county government, so that local government is as transparent as possible, so that those individuals that live locally and run businesses and all of those kinds of things, they can participate in their local government. Now, obviously, COMA also applies to states and their taxing to the state of Kansas and all of its taxing subdivisions and things like that. Uh, but obviously, I'm going to focus mostly on county government um, and the smaller entities within county government as we talk today. All right. So what are we going to do today? I always like to give a roadmap of how we're going to proceed through our discussion today, and we'll do the same today. So we're going to cover what is the Kansas Open Meeting Act. We're going to we're going to answer the question what does it require? We're going to talk about areas where problems pop up. Um that's always something that I I like to touch on and then if you've seen any of my presentations, you know I always like to wrap up with some best practices so that you have some things that you can take from this presentation and hopefully apply them in the work that you are doing currently. So diving right in Kansas Open Meetings Act. What is it? It is the sunshine law for the state of Kansas. Um, and basically all that means is that it encourages public business to be done in the light so that people can see what is going on. We do not want public business being done in darkness. We don't want things hidden from the public um, as much as possible. We want things to be done in the light if it is possible to do that without obviously invading privacy and things like that. I should also mention that um, as we are participating, as Kim mentioned, 
Um, I am open to taking questions. So if you want to type your questions in the Q&A box, um, I would encourage you to do so. I am happy to, to catch those questions as they pop up and answer them as I go through the slides. So please feel free to ask questions as we move through the presentation here today. All right, so the Kansas Open Meetings Act requirements. Um, KSA 754318 says all meetings for the conduct of the affairs of and the transaction of business by agencies of the state and their political and taxing subdivisions thereof shall be open to the public. This means that as a rule, the meetings of any political and taxing subdivision or any agency of the state, those meetings should be open to the public so that the public can participate. The exception is to close meetings. That is the exception, not the rule. The standard rule, the expectation of meetings is that they be open to the public because again, an informed electorate is important to um, having a, a participant government. And so therefore we need to have meetings as a rule that are open to the public. All right, so how do we know if the Kansas Open Meetings Act applies? We simply follow the money. If an entity is receiving tax dollars, that entity is likely subject to coma. Um, and then obviously, if it is a political or taxing subdivision, as counties, as townships, as um, junior college boards, as cities, you are all responsible or you are all subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act because you are receiving tax dollars and you are a political or taxing subdivision of the state of Kansas, which means COMA applies to you, which means it's great that you have joined us here today because this applies to all of you. So let's talk about what a meeting is um, because a meeting isn't just the gathering of different people. Um, a meeting can be in person or through technology. So this, this today, could be considered a meeting if the other items are also met. But a meeting can be in person or through technology if it involves all three of the following. One, a majority of the decision-making body. Two, that majority has to be communicating. And three, that communication has to be about business that could come before the body. It doesn't have to happen all at the same time, but those three things, a majority of the body, the majority communicating, and that communication being about business that could come before the body, those three things have to be in place in order for a meeting to occur. So let's break all of those down. What's a meeting? A majority of the body. We are talking about half plus one. That would constitute a majority, not just half, but half plus one. Now, when we are doing the math on this, you must count the total number of seats that are included in the body, not just the filled seats. You have to count the total number of seats. So for a governing body that has three members, two members is a majority. Obviously, five means three are a governing majority, seven is four is a governing majority, and 10 is means that six individuals are a governing majority. Now, we have to remember, because we have to count all of the seats that are available, not just the filled seats, let's say we have, for example, a library board. And that library board only has seven seats, but currently two of those seats are not filled. So there are only five active members on the library board. A majority is still four because there are seven total seats on the library board, even though only five of them are filled right now. Seven total seats still exist, and so a majority of the body is four. It is not, it does not drop down to five just or to three just because there are only five individuals currently on the board. It still is four. That is something that is important to remember when we are talking about the a majority of the body. So a majority would still be four. Now that also means that a majority is four for the purposes of, quor of quorum as well. So that's something to keep in mind. 
but we always have to make sure that we are counting the total number of seats, not just the filled seats when determining whether or not we have a majority of the body. We also have to have that majority communicating, and this is important. They have to actually be communicating in order for it to constitute a meeting. Now, communication, because we have technology now, can be through any sort of meeting, medium. So it can be in person. Obviously, we understand what that would look like. But it can also be via email. It can also be on the phone, via text, video conference, other technologies that have not even, that we haven't even thought about yet. So if there's new technologies that come, that come into play later on that we haven't thought of right now, if you are able to communicate through that means, that would constant that would be potentially communication for the purposes of determining if something is a meeting. So we need to make sure that we are aware of that. And that communication can also take place in separate phases. This is very important to remember. The communication does not have to happen all at once. So obviously, if we are in person and we are talking back and forth, that's one form of communication. But if I send you an email today on Thursday, and then somebody doesn't respond to that email until next Monday, and then the next person doesn't resp respond to that email until next Tuesday, that is still communication. It does not have to be all happening at the same time or even happening in generally the same time. It can be spread out over a number of hours or days with that communication. And that's why we need to be careful with how we communicate. And I'll touch on that later as we get into some of the other, um, some of the other issues that come up with the Kansas Open Meetings Act. But we need to make sure that we are aware that when we are communicating, that communication doesn't have to happen all at once to constitute a meeting. That is the important takeaway here, is that it does not have to happen all at once. And then that communication has to be about a specific topic, and that topic has to be about business that may come before the body. Now, business that may come before the body is actually a fairly broad topic, and I wanna make sure that we all understand what that means. So business that come that may come before the body includes the following pending agenda items. So if your agenda for your county commission or your township board or your library board or your water district, if that business comes out or if your agenda comes out and you have three items listed, obviously those three pending items are business that's going to come before the body. Oh, I, I have a question here. It says, how do you make a text available to the public? Okay, so for governing bodies, I encourage them to not communicate via text. Um, and the reason is because it is difficult to make texts available to the public. You would need to save all of your text messages. There are obviously programs out there that can do that. Um, but generally, that is something that I would discourage as a best practice, simply because it is very difficult to disclose all, um, all of those texts um, to the public. And secondly, there's no way for the public to be able to participate in that discussion. And it's very difficult to provide the notice that's required for the Open Meetings Act in order for the public to be aware that that discussion is taking place. And so for that reason, I discourage having meetings via text message because it is very, very difficult for the public to actually be able to participate in that type of discussion. And it's also very, very difficult for the public to be made aware in advance that those types of discussions are, um, are going to take place so that they can be aware and participate. Um, diving back into business that may come before the body, pending agenda items. So if you release your agenda on Fridays and that agenda has three items on it, obviously those three items that are listed on the agenda are business that's going to come before the body at the next meeting. And so therefore that would fall under um, the jurisdiction of the Kansas Open Meetings Act. But we also have potential future agenda items. In other words, things that are not on next week's agenda or next month's agenda or next quarter's agenda, potential future agenda items are also subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act. So um, we all just went through a budget cycle and had all of our budget meetings and things like that. 
But if we start talking about next year's budget, that's a potential future agenda item. In other words, it's something that is not on next week's agenda, but it will be on a future agenda. We know that we will have to pass a budget in 2024. And so that is a future agenda item that, that could come up. And so that would all having a discussion about what we're going to do on next year's budget, even though it's not on next week's agenda or next month's agenda or next quarter's agenda, that's a future agenda item. And so we we cannot have those discussions outside of an open meeting. We also have matters that are under the jurisdiction of the body. So let's say, for example, that your county um, has the ability to purchase property. And there is a property that is up in the north portion of the county that may be useful as an annex for the county road department. Well, purchasing that piece of property is a matter that is under the jurisdiction of the county commission. It's not on the current agenda. Um, we haven't decided whether we're going to um, purchase that property or not. So it's not even a future agenda item, but it is something that's under the jurisdiction of the body. In other words, if that issue were to come up, the, the county commission would have the ability to make that decision. And because of that, that also falls under the Kansas Open Meetings Act, because it is a matter that is under the jurisdiction of the body and therefore should not be discussed other than in an open meeting. All of these elements, all three of the elements we just talked about, so a majority of the body that is communicating about business that could come before the body, all three of those items must be present in order for there to be a meeting. All three elements have to be there. So if you have a body of five, and you have two of those governing board members having a discussion, that is not a majority of the body. So they could talk about, they could have a communication about business that could come before a body of before the body, and that would not con constitute a meeting because there is not a majority of the body. However, if those if those two um, individuals that are on the governing board leave that discussion and then go and have separate discussions about that discussions about that discussion with other members of the governing body because again all of those elements do not have to happen at the same time then we do have a potential violation of the open meetings act because now we do have a majority of the body involved uh, I have a question here it says what about a county that has a county administrator so commissioners want to tour or visit departments after a public meeting? Can the majority visit departments together? Again, this is one of those things that the county commission could, for instance, say, after the meeting, we are going to go out to the road department and visit the road supervisor, and the public is able to join us at such and such address. That would, pr that would provide the notice necessary to continue the open meeting at the county road department. But again, if you don't provide that type of notice, if you don't let the public know so that they can participate and see what is going on at that level, then that would be a potential open meetings violation. I always discourage um, county commissioners from, from having those types of visits together um, simply because if they start talking about those issues, then again, they are now discussing business that could come before the body. Obviously, the department head can communicate the same information to each of the commissioners, but they should not be having those meetings separate. They should not be having those meetings with all of the commissioners. And the department head also needs to be careful in those situations to not tell the commissioners what other commissioners have said in those meetings about certain topics, because again, that is then passing along that information in a way that could cause communication. So we need to be aware of those things, particularly when we're having meetings with department heads and other non-elected um, or, or elected or non-elected staff. But again, all of the elements must be present and everybody really does need to be aware 
of those elements so that they can avoid some of the pitfalls that we find with violations of the Open Meetings Act. Okay, so what does the Open Meetings Act require? Uh, the first thing that it requires is notice. And this notice doesn't have to be formal. It, it doesn't have to be um, produced on any sort of specific type of document or anything like that. But it does have to include certain things. It has to include the date, the time, and the location of the meeting. And again, this is why um, communicating via text is such a difficult thing because how would you issue that notice? How would you include the date, time, and location of a text meeting or an email meeting? Because you don't know when that gathering is gonna take place. You don't know when somebody's gonna send a text. So it's very, very difficult to provide the proper notice um, that COMA requires because you have to include the date, the time, and the location of that meeting. Whereas if you're having, for instance, a virtual meeting via Zoom or, or any of the other um, web platforms, you can certainly include the date, just like we did for today's, for today's meeting. We included the date, obviously October the 19th. We included the time, 11 o'clock in the morning. And we included the location because you all were able to join with the link for the meeting, which is the location for today's meeting. So you had all of the information that you needed in order to participate in this meeting. And so that information was out there for you and you were able to participate. If you didn't have that information, if you had the date, October 19th, and the time, 11 o'clock, but you did not have the link, you would not have been able to participate today. And so that's a really important thing as you think about open meetings is you have to give people all of the information that they would otherwise need so that they can participate in the meeting. And that includes both, that includes all three of the date, the time, and the location. If you lack any of those things, it becomes incredibly difficult for individuals to participate. And as a result of having that difficulty in participation, that makes it also very, very difficult for them to, to have the representative government and to be able to get involved in the things that are going on. And then the third thing with notices is that any request for notice is valid for the remainder of the fiscal year. Since most counties operate on a calendar year fiscal year, that means that if, a, if somebody requested notice for your open meetings on today, they would request that notice and that notice would be good until December the 31st. And then if they wanted to continue to receive those notices into 2024, they would need to make a new request to receive those notices into 2024 because their request that was that is made today would only be valid until December 31st of 2023. We've got another question here. It says, to follow the guidelines presented, should we have made the public aware of this meeting today? Well, do we have all three elements? Do we have a majority of the governing body? Is that majority also communicating? Now, in this case, I am presenting information to you and you are able to ask questions, but you're not communicating with each other. And so it is very difficult to say that we have all three of the elements present because we don't have that the majority is communicating about business that may come before the body. Because we also have to think about the things we're talking about. Obviously, all of you are subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, but in your positions as um, county commissioners or county officials or township officials or whatever that may be, you don't have the ability to change the Kansas Open Meetings Act. You're required to follow it, certainly, but you but the Kansas Open Meetings Act doesn't come up as business that could come before your body because you have no control or ability to change that. So the public likely would not be need would not need to be made aware of this. Now, if as a result of this meeting, however, you call up your fellow township board member or your fellow county commissioner and discuss with them, should we have a new open meetings policy as a result of the things that we heard in today's presentation? Well, now that is business that could come before the body. And that, because now you're talking about a county policy and that would be an issue. But as of right now, you don't have all three elements of the Open Meetings Act present to make this constitute a meeting. 
So again, talking about the notice requirements, any request for that notice is valid for the remainder of the fiscal year. So if you are operating on a different fiscal year, because um, I know that some cities, obviously school districts and other entities operate on a non-calendar year basis. So any request is valid for the remainder of the fiscal year. You need to be aware of when your fiscal year ends so that you communicate properly when those notices um, become no longer valid or when the, um, the request for those notices are no longer valid and need to be renewed. Moving on, COMA does not require that you allow for public comment during an open meeting. You do not have to allow for public comment during an open meeting. It's certainly something that you can do, but it is not something that is required in order to have a public meeting. It also does not require that you publish an agenda. Now, an agenda is obviously an important tool in letting uh, the public know what is going to be discussed during an open meeting, but COMA does not require that you publish an agenda. Now, that doesn't mean that you should stop publishing agendas, because again, that's an important tool. Um, there are also other things that obviously you need to uh, publish an agenda before special meetings and things like that. So this doesn't mean that just because it's not required by the Open Meetings Act that you no longer have to publish an agenda. And then three, COMA does not require that you have meeting minutes following a meeting. Now, again, there are other things that do require that you record meeting minutes um, in certain circumstances, but those do not fall under the Kansas Open Meetings Act. So just just make sure that you are aware of those three things that the Open Meetings Act is not a violation to not allow for public comment or to not publish an agenda or meeting minutes. And there are certain times where um, some of those things, um, where it makes sense where you would do those things, uh, but it is not required under the Open Meetings Act specifically. All right, so diving into where do we run into problems? Because this is really, this is really why you all joined the, 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 the meeting today is really so that you could understand where you run into problems and how to avoid those problems. You didn't want just the basics. You want to really understand how to avoid the problems that come with um, the Kansas Open Meetings Act so that you can run as you can run the most transparent form of government. Um, and so one big problem is those governing body conversations outside of meetings that turn to business. So let's imagine the scenario of um, uh, tomorrow's Friday night and you've got two commissioners that are at the big high school football game as we come up on the, um, the end of the season and we're, we're, we're into the playoffs and things like that. Um, and so the, the two commissioners are there and they are, they're talking about how well the team is playing. That's perfectly fine because governing body members can have conversations outside of official meetings. However, those conversations, we have to be aware to make sure those conversations are not turning to business when they are outside of those open meetings. Because having a conversation at the high school football game about how well the team is playing, that's not business that may come before the body. Although we all like to play Monday morning quarterback, that may not be, or Monday morning coach, that may not be, that's not business that actually is going to come before the governing body. However, if that conversation turns from how well the team is playing or how the game is going or whether or not you should have gone for it on fourth and two in the second quarter, if those conversations turn to what are we going to do about the road that runs in front of the high school or how are we going to handle snow removal this fall um, or this winter to make sure that we don't disrupt the school schedule? Well, now that is business that could come before the body because those are items over which the county commission has jurisdiction. And so now the conversation that turned from having a conversation about the high school football game to having conversations about the roads outside of that lead to the high school. Those are conversations that now turned towards business that could come before the body. And those are the types of conversations we have to avoid. Because again, those governing body conversations, we can talk about the high school football game all day long. 
we can break down every single play we want to outside the high school football game, and that is not a meeting. However, if we start talking about, well, we probably need to um, have more sheriff's deputies out here during the high school football game to direct traffic after the game, now that is business that, again, could come before the body. And so you have to be very, very careful of that. And I encourage all of our governing body members to be very aware, particularly when you are having conversations with other members of the governing body about the subjects that you are talking about and to be very, very careful. Always think about, is this something that could come up in an open meeting? Because if it is, if it's something that you have jurisdiction over on the county commission, or if it's something that you could take up as the county commission, or if you know that it is on a future agenda or on an upcoming agenda, that is not something that is appropriate to be talking about outside of the context of an open meeting. We also have some other problems that, that we run into from time to time. And those other problems are um, serial meetings. Um, we also have issues with failing to properly publish notices, and then we also have improper executive sessions. We have those three things that are kind of three other common problem areas, and so I want to spend a few minutes talking about each of those so we make sure that we highlight each of those things. First is serial meetings. Um, serial meetings, um, first, let's just define it so we all understand what we're talking about. A serial meeting is where there is a series of interactive communications, which individually, as we talked about earlier, have fewer than the total required for a majority of the body, but collectively, there is a majority of the body. So the example that I gave earlier, where we have um, meetings with department heads, and those department heads are not in the meeting all together at the same time. Each commissioner is going to talk to that department head separately. But you run into the issue of during that meeting with the department head, the department head says, oh, Commissioner B, Commissioner A was just in here and he said, blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, Commissioner B, Commissioner C was just in here and she told me that. Or what are your thoughts about what Commissioner C said yesterday in the meeting? Or how would you like to handle this based on what Commissioner A already told me? That is a serial meeting. We have to avoid serial meetings because now we're allowing the governing body to communicate um, through the presence of that third party, through that department head. And so there are, there are three things that I... I that I encourage everyone to do in order to avoid these serial meetings. The first is, of course, do not reply all to emails. When you reply all, that encourages everybody else to start replying all because we are all, uh, we, we're creatures of habit, we're, but we are also all, um, generally we, we get into these things of if one person replies all, then the next person replies all. And before you know it, you have a string of emails that has occurred where there is communication between the body about business that could come before the body. So avoid replying all to emails. Instead, just reply to the individual senders. That way you don't have um, communicating between the governing body. Um, the second thing is don't tell one commissioner what another commissioner has told you outside of an open meeting. Save those discussions for open meetings. You don't want to become the conduit for that type of communication. Um, and then the third thing kind of along that same line is do not have unofficial communications channels by county staff where this person tells this other person and they relay that to other commissioners so that the commissioners aren't talking, but they're being told those things by other county staff that are being passing messages back and forth. You really want to avoid and discourage those unofficial communications channels, because, again, you don't want anybody to become a conduit for those unofficial communications uh, between commissioners or board members um, that are outside of that open meeting structure. Second issue, second area that we have um, where we where we sometimes get tripped up. Oh, we've got a question before we dive into that. 
what is the punishment for violating coma? What are the ramifications of an accidental reply off? So the punishments for violating coma, um, coma is a, you have a personal responsibility. So that means the person, the responsibility rests on the individual members of the governing body, the governing board, whatever it may be. So you have a responsibility as a governing board member to make sure that you are not replying all, that you are not participating in those outside unofficial communications. Um, typically, for something like um, an accidental reply all, you may just have to attend some more training. But for habitual offenders, there are fines that can be issued um, for repeat and habitual offenders. Um, and, and that's why we have programs like this so that we make sure that you're aware of these things so that you can avoid those things so that you don't become a habitual offender that is subject to fines so that you aren't um, that you don't uh, that that we clear these things up with good training rather than having issues with um, consistently and constantly making those kinds of mistakes, um, introducing those kinds of problems. And so really, we want to make sure that our training is strong enough that we avoid those types of problems. Uh, getting into the failure to properly publish notices. And this is something that is important because obviously the big requirement for the Kansas Open Meetings Act is that we have to publish a notice. We have to let people know when and where the meeting is going to take place. So we have to give them the date, the time, and the location of the meeting. We have to do that. That is required by the Kansas Open Meetings Act. Failure to properly publish those notices, failure to make sure those notices are actually getting out to the public is therefore a problem. And that is one of the big things that we need to make sure we solve. So how do we solve it? Well, we solve it by making sure that we have a process for getting those notices out to the public. We have to have a process because processes help keep us from making mistakes in these kinds of small technical areas. So the first thing we should do is whoever is setting the meeting as a best practice should also send out the notice. Because if I'm setting the meeting, I also I know that I've set the meeting so I can send out the notice as soon as I set the meeting, rather than if I set the meeting, have it be somebody else's responsibility because that somebody else may not realize that I set the meeting and may not get that notice sent out. If the same person that sets the meeting also sends out the notice of the meeting, you avoid having the potential of having those types of things fall through the cracks. Just having that sound process of whoever sets the meeting sends out the notice keeps you from having those types of things fall through the cracks. Second thing is you should have a process for any special meetings as to how you will send out the notice. And this is because special meetings by their very nature are unique. So you need to make sure that you have a process for getting that notice out. Um, and this could also be because when you have a special meeting, um, oftentimes these things also happen in the case of an emergency. So this isn't your regularly scheduled thing. Uh, this isn't something where you know already, you know well in advance. We always have commission meetings on Tuesdays. Well, you know that well in advance because if it's Tuesday, you're having a, a, a commission meeting. So you know that you put out the agenda on Fridays, you send out the agenda on Fridays. You already know that you send out the notice and the agenda on Fridays because the commission meeting is always on Tuesday. But for special meetings, you don't have that luxury of it being something that is scheduled well in advance. You may have a situation where you have a flood and it comes through and wipes out a bridge or something like that, and you have to have an emergency meeting. You should have a process for announcing that that emergency meeting is taking place. You should have a process for how that notice is going to go out how much advance notice you're going to give. So if it's an emergency meeting, you may say we are going to give at least four hours notice for emergency meetings so that you can have, so that you can notify people of location. You also may need to have those processes for if there's something that happens that makes it so that you cannot use your normal facility for that particular meeting. You may have to have that meeting somewhere else and you should have a process that allows you to get that notice out 
even if your normal facilities are not available. You should have a process in place. That process should ideally be written so that you are prepared to just move directly into that process um, if the situation merits it. Because as we all know from different types of emergencies, having those processes in place and just being able to move into our emergency procedures is much easier than having to figure out what to do in those crisis moments. And then thirdly, obviously, controversial topics should be noticed well in advance. If you know that you're going to have a meeting about something that the public is very, very wound up about, rather than trying to bury it on an agenda, which I know may seem like something that just is going to make it easier, announce that well in advance because people are going to be more upset if they discover that they missed this meeting because they did not know that that topic was going to come up, then they will be, if they had three weeks prior notice that this controversial topic was going to come up, let them know that that topic is going to come up so that that way they are aware of it and they are ready for that topic. Uh, we've got a question that says, would a notice on the official Facebook page be acceptable? That's certainly a great way to get that information out there is to put the notice on the official Facebook page. I actually encourage people to put your notices in multiple places. So if you've got a Facebook page, if you have um, also have a county web page, if you have obviously um, you still use the official newspaper as well, if you can put that notice out in multiple places, that is uh, that is great because again, making sure that that notice is available as widely as possible means that nobody can say that you were trying to bury the lead. Nobody can say that you weren't being transparent because there were five or six or eight different places that they could have found the notice for the meeting. It was on Facebook. It was on the artist formerly known as Twitter. It was on all of these different places where it was available for you to make sure that the public was aware of when and where that meeting was taking place. So I actually encourage you to put that notice in as many places as possible. So if the, if there's a meeting coming up and, and people follow your Facebook page, definitely that's a great place to be putting it. Um, it said, I have another question here. It says, Does, do notices need to be mailed out using certified mailings? Um, there is not a requirement that you use certified mail um, to deliver notices. Um, you just you do need to make sure that your notices are going out and that they are being made public, uh, particularly for the parties that have requested them. Um, oftentimes, parties that request those notices, um, email notification is really what they're looking for because again, that that makes it so much easier. Um, and and as I've talked about, and as we'll dive into this next slide, be sure that your notices are being made public. So when you're putting them on the Facebook page, make sure um, that you're that you're making sure that that notice goes out on your Facebook page. When you're publishing those notices to your county website, make sure that you actually publish that page so that people can actually see it. You don't want that page to be hidden to where the public isn't actually seeing it where the edit has been made in the background, but nobody in the public can be seen, can see it. Always check to make sure that somebody can see that notice um, after you've published it, just to make sure that those notices are going out to be going out to the public. That is something that is crucially important. Uh, so we wanna make sure that those notices are being made public. We want to make sure that we are getting that information out there. It doesn't have to be via certified mail, uh, but you do want to make sure that you have, for instance, the correct email addresses um, so that you are reaching the people that have requested those notices. All right. Be persistent and insistent about your process. And you say, Jay, what are you talking about being persistent and insistent about a process? Well, consistency, at least the, the good kind of consistency, the kind of consistency that I think all of us actually want, it requires that we be insistent about doing things the right way. We have to insist on that. But we also have to be persistent about doing those things that way every single time we do them. So if we do the good kind of consistency, we do things the right way, we insist on things being done the right way every single time they are done. And we persist in doing them that way every single time. We have to be that kind of consistent. 
or we could be the bad kind of consistent where nobody knows what they're going to get. It's consistent to be unreliable because if you're always unreliable, you are consistent, but that's not the kind of consistency that we're actually looking for. We want to make sure that we are the good kind of consistent, doing things the right way and doing them the right way all the time. All right, so I, I've got to spend a few minutes talking about executive sessions um, because executive sessions is where we get tripped up a lot. And part of this is obviously a misunderstanding on the part of the public about what is and is not appropriate in executive sessions. But the other side of this is that um, there's sometimes a misunderstanding or mishandling of executive sessions on the part of counties or county staff. And so we want to make sure that we are handling that um, properly on both sides. Um, so the first thing is to make sure that we understand what an executive session actually is. An executive session is a closed portion of an otherwise open meeting. Let me say that again to make sure everybody catches that. An executive session is a closed portion of an otherwise open meeting. What does that mean? That means very specifically, we cannot go into an executive session unless we first have an open meeting. So you can't say, oh, well, I was talking to commissioner so-and-so and it's fine because we were having that discussion in an executive session. No, because executive sessions, proper executive sessions cannot take place outside of an otherwise open meeting. So you have to have an open meeting that is already going on and then adjourn into an executive session to close a portion of that otherwise open meeting. You cannot just have an executive session without first having an open meeting. It is very, very critical that we all understand that because we have to make sure that we understand what an executive session is so that we handle those executive sessions appropriately. So an executive session is an opportunity to receive non-public information uh, that's generally non-public for some sort of privacy or security reasons. And that is why we go into executive session. Executive session is not a place to make to um, for people to say things that they don't want the public to hear. That is not the purpose of executive session. You aren't going into executive session. You should not, you cannot go into executive session just to say things that may be unpopular or things that um, you really don't want in the public discourse. That is not the purpose of executive session. It is inappropriate to go into executive session for that purpose. You also cannot go into executive session to make decisions. Executive session is not a place to make decisions. It is inappropriate to take a vote in executive session. You should not be making a decision in executive session. You should just be getting the information. Now, that information may be the basis upon which you make a decision at a later time, but you are not making that decision in executive session. You are simply getting the information that will be used to later on make a decision. You also cannot go into executive session, as I stated before, without first starting an open meeting. Because again, an executive session is a part of an otherwise open meeting. It is a portion, it's a closed portion of an open meeting. You cannot have an executive session without an open meeting. The two are joined together. You can't have an executive session if you do not first have an open meeting. All right, so what do you need to do to go into executive sessions? Well, you need three things. You need a statutory justification, you need a subject, and you need to tell the public when the open meeting will resume. Because again, executive sessions are a closed portion of an otherwise open meeting. So you have to let the public know when the open portion of the meeting will begin again. It is a technical violation to not include the statutory justification, the subject and the time will when the open meeting will resume in your motion to adjourn into executive session. We have to be very careful to make sure that all three of those things are included in the motion because that is required in order to avoid a technical violation of the Open Meetings Act. 
Also remember that the subject and the justification need to match. You have different justifications um, statutorily to go into executive session, probably the most popular of which is um, to discuss non, um, non-elected personnel. That is a justification, but the subject matter that you're going in to discuss should match that. You should always have the justification and the subject matching in your motion. Don't go into executive sessions if there is no statutory justification. Don't make something up on the fly. Don't try to shoehorn something in where it doesn't fit. If you don't have a statutory justification, you cannot go into executive session. Listed here on this slide, some of the more popular um, statutory justifications. Um, obviously, these are not all of the statutory justifications, but these are um, probably the most popular um, statutory justifications that we have out there. Um, I'd say the first three are probably the ones that get used the most, um, although security measures is, is starting to move up that list and, and may we may go from a top three to a top four. Um, but then the others that you see, there are also um, important justifications that, that get used probably more than some of the others. Um, as I said, um, person, personnel matters for non-elected personnel is probably uh, the most popular um, justification with attorney-client uh, communications, probably uh, trailing that by a little bit. But as I said, security measures is moving up that list um, just because of some of the important things with, with both physical security as well as cybersecurity uh, being things that you can talk about in executive session because obviously um, you don't want everybody knowing what your security measures, what your protections are um, when you... Um, when you are talking about security. So you, you may want to, you can go into executive session to have those types of discussions and receive those types of updates. All right, as I promised, we are going to have a few moments to talk about best practices, but I am going to um, address a question before I get into that. Um, and that question is, can you come out of executive session before your time stated? You can wrap up the executive session early. However, you cannot restart the open meeting before the time that you said the open meeting would restart. Um, and I've got a slide here and a couple of slides to talk about that, but you can end the executive session early. So if you have a, if you're in executive session, um, you can certainly have different discussions in executive session. And if you said you would finish at noon, but you're done with your discussions at 1153, you can certainly wrap up at 1153 and take a break at that point. Uh, you just can't restart the open meeting until 12. Got another question. It says, must details be given of the executive session once returning to the open meeting? Or can a vote be taken in open meeting with generic description of what was discussed in the executive session? So the, in the executive session, you can receive the information, um, and obviously that, that information is going to be private. You can come out of executive session, um, and once you are out of the executive session, then you can have a discussion about how you are going to vote um, with consideration of the information you receive. Now, Obviously, because that information was passed along in executive session, you don't want to specifically discuss what you discussed in executive session, but you can say things like, given the information that we received in executive session, um, the county is going to approve new security measures, or I, I make a motion to approve new security measures consistent with what has been laid out um, in executive session something like that that's generic enough, you can make those types of motions. You can have discussions and all of those kinds of things after that to lay out how um, the rationale for votes or things like that. You just don't want to discuss the things that were actually discussed in executive session. <clears throat> Uh, someone else asks, is a county EMS meeting a public meeting? Um, let, let's think again about um, the requirements for does... Um, does the Open Meetings Act apply? Does county EMS receive public funds? 
if it does receive public funds because it receives taxpayer funds, it would be subject to the Open Meetings Act. If, on the other hand, it is a private entity, then it would not be receiving public funds um, and would not be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So it's really about, again, following the money to in order to make that determination. Uh, and we've got one last question before I get into the um, the best practices, and that is, can the board come out of executive session late without a new motion? Um, no. If you are getting up to the time when you said you would come out of executive session and you are running out of time and you realize, OK, the discussion is still going um, and we said we'd be out of the executive session at 1155, it's now 1154 and we still have several more minutes of discussion, come out of executive session make a new motion and go back into executive session. Don't just keep going in executive session. Come out, make a new motion to extend that executive session to allow for a continued discussion and then go back into executive session under that new motion. All right, and then we have a question. It says, are staff meetings ever considered open meetings? Again, let's think about this. Is there a majority of the governing body that is there at that staff meeting? If the answer is yes, then it would need to be an open meeting that is noticed to the public so that they have the opportunity to, to attend. If, on the other hand, you're a county that has a county administrator, um, which is not a member of the governing board, and that county administrator calls a staff meeting that doesn't include the commissioners, that would not need to be an open meeting because you don't have a majority of the body there discussing business that may come before the body. All right. Best practices. First best practice, always remember to plan ahead. We always need to remember that when we are dealing with these types of things, we need to plan ahead. We need to make sure that we have planned ahead um, so that we are prepared um, for anything that may come up. And, and this is whether you have executive sessions, this is, this is just looking at your agenda, knowing how much time you need for different topics, knowing what's going to be required for that particular day so that everything kind of is laid out and is, is, is planned for and that you are prepared and ready for all of those things. Um, so always remember to plan ahead. That's good advice, obviously, for the Open Meetings Act, but that's just good, good life advice in general. Um, plan ahead, be prepared for those things. Second thing, have a process for your notices, follow that process, be consistent. And again, we want to be that good kind of consistent. We want to be insistent about doing things the right way. We want to be persistent about doing them that way every single time. Looks like we have another question. It says, for attorney-client executive session, the attorney must be present. Can other people be present such as the administrator? So the short answer is yes, but. And the reason I say yes, but is because we want to make sure that when we are in executive session, the only people that are there in the executive session are people that need to be there. You should not have an executive session with excess people that don't need to be there. So if there's attorney-client privilege, but you need the administrator there because the administrator is going to be participating in that particular litigation, then certainly you can have the administrator present in that executive session with the governing body. But you should not also have other people in there that are not necessary for those discussions. You should only have the people that are necessary in any executive session. And that's whether you have an executive session with um, for attorney-client privilege or for anything else. Like, for example, if you're having a discussion about non-elected personnel, it may be appropriate to have the HR director there, or it may be appropriate to have um, that individual's um, direct supervisor in that executive session. But again, you may not need to have other people involved in that particular executive session because you only want the people that are necessary in the executive session. Got another question. It says, does this include the county clerk? Certainly, if the county clerk needs to be in the executive session, they should be there. If the county clerk does not need to be in the executive session, they should not be in there. It really comes down to what the subject matter is and whether or not that particular individual is necessary to the discussions in order to advance the discussions that are being had in executive session. All right, again, want to be the good kind of consistent. 
And that is to be insistent about doing things the right way and persistent about doing those things that way every single time we do them. Um, good piece of advice on executive sessions, write out that motion in advance, and then you just have to fill in um, the time and the, the justification of things like that. So write that executive session motion out in advance. You should, again, because you've planned ahead, you know that this particular topic is coming up. You know that you need to have an executive session on that topic. So write that motion out in advance. That will help you avoid the technical violation because it helps you make sure that you have all of the elements there as you go, as you get ready for the executive session. So you don't leave out the just the statutory justification so that you don't leave out the subject of the executive session so that you don't leave out when you are going to return to the open meeting. Uh, it says, what if you need to meet with a property owner at their office to discuss a purchase? Um, if you need to meet with the property owner, if the governing body needs to meet with the property owner, that is better done by having them come to the open meeting um, to participate. Um, if they cannot do that, then it may be more appropriate to have one commissioner go and meet with them privately and then have an executive session during the next open meeting, at which point that commissioner can relay what was discussed offsite. Uh, but you you really do need to, if you're going to have those types of discussions, they need to be done, again, in the context of an open meeting so that you have a justified executive session. Again, write those motions out in advance. That helps you make sure that you are not um, missing anything as you're getting ready for those discussions. Keep those executive session discussions confidential. You want to make sure that you are not coming out of executive session and disclosing things that otherwise should be kept private. Because again, what's the purpose of going into executive session if you reveal this, the private information publicly? So make sure you're keeping those executive session discussions confidential. Um, and then, of course, as, as we just discussed with the question, do not return from that executive session early. If you're done a few minutes early, take a break. Let everybody go to the bathroom or go get some coffee um, or just enjoy, um, enjoy the weather. Don't return from an executive session early and start, the, start your business again. Because again, if I'm waiting for the item that comes up right after your executive session, and you said that you're going to come back at 12 o'clock and I return at 12 o'clock and you're already past the item that I, that, that I as a public person was interested in, I am going to be upset because I think that you are hiding things from me as Joe Q citizen. So don't return from executive sessions early. If you finish up before you are ready to go back into the, before the time has come to go back into the regular session, just take a break. If you said 12 o'clock, that's 12 o'clock. That's not 1158. That's not 1156. 12 o'clock is 12 o'clock. And with that, questions. Are there any other questions that anyone has? Looks like we have a question. Um, or no, we don't have a question. Are there any other questions that anyone has? And obviously I've got my um, contact information there. If you need to reach out, if you have a question, but you haven't thought of it yet, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, it says, does notice of meeting times and places need to be made yearly if those don't change? Yes, you need to make sure that when you are issuing your meeting notices, you include that information. Your meeting notice needs to include the place and the time just to make sure, because this may be the first time that somebody is participating in your meeting and they may not be aware of what you have done in the past. You may have somebody that is new to your county. You may have someone that um, this is the first time they've appeared before your county commission or before your zoning board, and they don't know the proper protocol because this is their first time. So you can't just, we can't assume that they are aware that we've met on Tuesdays at nine o'clock for the last 35 years because they don't have that 35 years of background. We have to make sure that, um, that we give them that proper notice. All right, if there are any other questions, please get them in at this time. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us.
for the Kansas Open Meetings Act. I would encourage you all to join us again at one o'clock for the Kansas Open Records Act, where we will look at the other side of transparency, and that is count that is public records. And so I'd encourage anybody that's interested in that. Um, I know a lot of people have signed up, so I would encourage all of you to join us at one o'clock for those discussions. Thank you very much, and I hope to see many of you again here at one o'clock. Thanks, Jay. Great presentation. We'll see everybody back here at one for the Kansas Open Records Act. <laughs>